Right, so hello and welcome back to Books and Things and welcome to the first discussion video in my current Dickens along, our Victorian style 18 month read along of Charles Dickens' Bleak House. If you don't know what this is, I will link down below the read along announcement where I talked about what this is, but basically I am currently hosting or just starting to host a Victorian style serialised read along of Charles Dickens' Bleak House where we read the book in the original serialised parts in which it was originally published from March 2018 to September 2019 I think, so it's gonna be a long one but I am very excited to do this one. I've done the same with Charles Dickens' Our Mutual Friend previously and I'll link down the playlist of those videos below, you know, if you want to watch eight hours of me talking about Our Mutual Friend. In the month of March we read the first four chapters of Bleak House, that is chapter one in Chancery, chapter two in Fashion, chapter three A Progress and chapter four Telescopic philanthropy. It's interesting reading Bleak House. I haven't read it for four years, I want to say. This is my fifth reading of Bleak House, and although my reading of Our Mutual Friend for the serialised read-along was also my fifth reading of Our Mutual Friend, I feel like I know Bleak House less well. I think possibly I have probably reread more individual scenes and chapters in Our Mutual Friend more regularly than I have of Bleak House, though I did also study Bleak House at university. In fact, I studied it twice. I studied it in my first year as part of a module on introduction to the novel, and I also studied it in my third year when it was one of the books I wrote about for my dissertation on Dickens as well as Our Mutual Friend. So I will have a lot to say about Bleak House and I love it a lot but I had forgotten like how long it takes for us to be introduced to Mr Jarndyce and also how quickly we're introduced to the Genovese. So as I did for the Our Mutual Friend read along what I'm going to do in these discussion videos is go through each of the chapters we read that month, talk about what happened in that chapter and then go through some sort of points of interest and interesting themes and characters and that sort of thing. So chapter one in Chancery. Chapter one in Chancery is mostly a descriptive chapter in which we are told about Chancery in London, what it's like, how miserable it is, how terrible it is, how London is incredibly foggy and incredibly muddy and generally quite horrible and a little bit dystopian, and how Chancery is a slow place in which law cases and people go to die. Dickens really doesn't like lawyers. We find out about this case in Chancery, Jarndyce and Jarndyce, where a will is being disputed, no one knows quite who the money is to go to, and so this case has been going on for decades. The end of the chapter we do have a dialogue exchange in which we find out that coming before Chancery today are two wards in Jarndyce, so two orphans who are younger than the age of 21 who have been sort of raised by the court in a way because they are potentially due to inherit from the case of Jarndyce and Jarndyce and that they have now been assigned to go and live with their distant cousin Mr John Jarndyce. So let's talk about this chapter. Firstly I'm just going to read like the opening paragraph of Bleak House because I think it is one of my favourite openings to a book ever and I just I love I love the writing. In Chancery, London, Michaelmas term lately over and the Lord Chancellor sitting in Lincoln's Inn Hall, implicatable November weather, as much mud in the streets as if the waters had but newly retired from the face of the earth and it would not be wonderful to meet a megalosaurus 40 feet long or so waddling like an elephantine lizard up Holborn Hill, smoke lowering down from the chimney pots making a soft black drizzle with flakes of soot in it as big as full-grown snowflakes, gone into mourning one might imagine for the death of the sun. Dogs undistinguishable in mire, horses scarcely better, splashed to their very blinkers, foot passages jostling one another's umbrellas in a general infection of ill temper and losing their foothold at street corners where tens of thousands of other foot passengers have been slipping and sliding since the day broke, if ever the day broke, adding new deposits to the crust upon crust of mud, sticking at those points tenacity to the pavement and accumulating at compound interest. Fog everywhere, fog up the river, where it flows among green eights and meadows, fog down the river where it rolls defiled among the tears of shipping and water pollutions of the great and dirty city, fog on the Essex marshes, fog on the Kentish Heights, fog creeping into kiboshes of collier brigs, fog lying out on the yards and hovering in the riggings of great ships, fog drooping the gunwales of barges and small boats, fog in the eyes and throats of ancient Greenwich pensioners, wheezing by the firesides of their wards, fog in the seam and bowl of the afternoon pipe of a wrathful skipper, close down in his close cabin, fog cruelly pinching the toes and and fingers of the shivering little apprentice boy on deck, chance people on the bridges peeping over the parapet into a nether sky of fog, with fog all around them as if they were up in a balloon and hanging in the misty clouds. I know that's a really long, like, two paragraphs, first page of the book to read, but can we just take a moment to appreciate this description? One of the reasons why I love Dickens is because I think his description is amazing, and stuff like this, I just think, 
is amazing. There is so much in this, aside from the fact that it's a incredibly vivid depiction and description of London in mud and fog. It also, from the very beginning of this book, associates London and the city with dirt and mud. One thing I'll point out as we go through Bleak House, because it's quite interesting, is that the city is always incredibly muddy. The countryside not very muddy. From the beginning we get London and the Court of Chancery associated with mud and fog, with things that obscure, with things that are dirty. From the beginning Chancery is associated with an absence of light, an absence of cleanliness, and an absence of anything that allows you to see. Everything in London and in Chancery is obscured by fog and mud, so it's no wonder that this case has been going on for so long and that the lawyers are unable to find everything because everything is so obscure. We get this theme of obscurity and things being sort of veiled and covered up from the very beginning. You also get a sense of the expanse of London and the power of London, the fact that the fog of London spreads so far up and down the river and so much around London, showing the sort of infectious and dangerous nature of this pollution and how it spreads and, and how the influence of London and the fog of London covers everything. It is a miserable depiction and it presents London as a miserable place, as a city that has gone into mourning for the loss of the sun. This is not a happy place and we get this depiction of a very bleak place. Bleak House doesn't feature in the first few chapters but we do get a sense of bleakness. And also I want to take a moment to appreciate the wonder of Dickens's writing here because we often think of the Victorians as people who write in like full sentences in a way that is entirely unexperimental. We often think of experimental writing as being something other modernist and onwards but I would argue that Dickens is a very experimental and unusual writer. Like if you look at those paragraphs there are no subjects to most of these sentences, these are not full sentences, they are fragments and yet it's so rich it creates such an impressive image and it is so thoroughly and, and wonderfully written that I do think like Dickens is such an interesting writer and his writing is for me quite experimental. Also interesting to note this book is a dual narrative. Esther's chapters are in first person past tense, very kind of traditional, whereas all of the general non-Esther chapters are in third person present tense, which is quite unusual for the Victorian period and quite experimental as well, and I think creates this really vivid picture. And it's also interesting because it means the book is told on two timelines, one in the immediate and one like looking back from several years in the future. Very interesting, very interesting. I spoke a lot in the Our Mutual Friend read along about how Our Mutual Friend associates money and rubbish and money and worthlessness, and I think it's interesting that in Bleak House the same can be said about the association of law and rubbish, law and dirt. Dickens at his heart is a social critique and what he criticises in a lot of Bleak House is law. The Lord Chancellor sits with a foggy glory. The lawyers are mistily engaged in one of the 10,000 stages of an endless cause, tripping one another up on slippery precedents, groping knee-deep in technicalities. Even the windows of the Court of Chancery lose their colour and admit no light of day. There is no space for light or intelligence in this world, it is just all foggy and misty and obscured. We also want to quickly mention our first vision of Miss Flight which we get in this chapter. Miss Flight is a very interesting character who I'll talk much more about as we go on through the book. But our first vision of her is a little mad old woman in a squeezed bonnet. Some say she really is or was a party to a suit, but no one knows for certain because no one cares. It's so stark and sad and brutal, this poor elderly woman who no one cares about whatsoever. I also want to talk a little bit about the way Dickens describes the case of Jarndyce and Jarndyce. I find his tone when he's describing the case quite interesting because at first he begins with quite a comic scene, a sense of this lawsuit that's been going on forever and how sort of ridiculous this is. The little platent or defendant who has promised a new rocking horse when Jarndyce and Jarndyce should be settled has grown up, possessed himself of a real horse and trotted away into the other world. Quite a comic tone. And then shortly after this there are not three Jarndyces left upon this earth perhaps since old Tom Jarndyce in despair blew his brains out in a coffee house in Chancery Lane. Very bleak language, we find out just what lengths this law case and its difficulties has driven people to. And again, a sense of how much Dickens doesn't like lawyers. It has been death to many, but it is a joke in the profession. And even if you look at the names of one of the lawyers we meet in this, Mr Tangle, he is called Mr Tangle because everything in law for Dickens and in the case of Jarndyce and Jarndyce is a tangle. I mentioned earlier Dickens' sort of experimental writing and I think it's quite interesting to note how in the sort of dialogue we get in the second half of this chapter a lot of the uh, prose reads like stage directions. So a sentence would be Mr Tangle on his legs again, Mr Tangle crushed rather than Mr Tangle's is on his legs again etc. Another thing I find really interesting about Dickens' writing style and one of the reasons I think why I love Bleak House so much is the particular writing style he uses in those third person chapters which 
I think is wonderful and so different from a lot of Victorian literature that it makes me very happy. I think that's all I wanted to say about that first chapter. I think it's really interesting how it sets up so many of the important themes of the book, especially the association with law and obscurity and the sort of general social critique of the mid 19th century legal profession as an institution. In the chapter in fashion we are introduced to the deadlocks, Lady Deadlock and Celeste Deadlock. Lady Deadlock is a bit younger than Celeste Deadlock but they've been married for a while. She is very very fashionable, the fashionable world loves her, society adores her, though they're a bit less interested in her husband. She is stopping in London on her way back from Chesney Wold, the family estate where her and Celeste Deadlock live, on her way to Paris. And while they are in London, they are visited by her lawyer, Mr. Tulkinhorn. I forgot how soon Mr. Tulkinhorn came into it. Look out for Mr. Tulkinhorn, he is one of the best drawn characters in all of Dickens. Seriously. We find out that Lady Deadlock is in some way associated with the Jarndyce and Jarndyce case, and Mr. Tulkinhorn begins to read a particular legal document. As he does, Lady Deadlock notices something about the writing on the document and asks Mr. Tulkinhorn about it. He doesn't really have any information to give her, and a moment later she faints, which Celeste Deadlock says is something she never does. So we know that something is a bit odd here, and we are forced to ask why. Why did she notice the handwriting? Why did she faint? Etc. Etc. So many interesting things to come. That's mostly what happens in this chapter. So, points of interest in this chapter. Lady Deadlock, actually, as well as Mr. Tulkinhorn, is one of the most amazing characters in Dickens. Man, I love Bleak House! I've forgotten! I've forgotten how much I love this. I think it's interesting to look at the way that the world of fashion is presented, especially in contrast to the world of chancery, because it is very different, but it's also equally stifling and obscuring. The world of fashion is not a large world. There is much good in it, there are many good and true people in it, it has its appointed place. But the evil of it is that it is a world wrapped up in too much jeweller's cotton and fine wool, and cannot hear the rushing of the larger world, and cannot see them as they circle round the sun. It is a deadened world, and its growth is sometimes unhealthy for want of air. We get the same sense of a stifling and obscure world, although it is a very different world to the world of Chancery. And I think the two first chapters of the book are named in Chancery and in Fashion on purpose to make us think about Chancery and Fashion in relation to each other and make us compare them. Especially actually as we get Mr. Tolkienhorn in this chapter and he kind of moves and invades from the world of Chancery to the world of Fashion. Both the world of Fashion and the world of Chancery are presented as slow, weary places in which nothing happens and everyone is a bit lacking in purpose. I want to talk about Lady Deadlock because she is an amazing, amazing character. Like Mr. Tolkienhorn, Lady Deadlock Deadlock is one of, I think, the best characters in Dickens, like in terms of her presentation and the way she's drawn. One thing I think is quite interesting is that the narrative voice, our mysterious third person omniscient narrator, spends a lot of the time referring to her not just as Lady Deadlock but as My Lady Deadlock, which is how you would refer to someone if you were a tenant on their land. So the fact that the sort of narrative voice here refers to her as My Lady Deadlock kind of places the narrative voice at a social position beneath Lady Deadlock, but at the same time my also suggests possession. And I want to talk about Lady Deadlock and her sense of detachment from life, because I think a lot of the ways in which Dickens describes her reads to a modern reader like someone who has depression, she feels detached from life, she feels dreary, she is bored of everything. My Lady Deadlock's place has been extremely dreary. My Lady Deadlock says she has been bored to death. My Lady Deadlock, having conquered her world, fell not into the melting but rather into the freezing mood, an exhausted composure, a worn-out placidity, an equimity of fatigue. Like her life, the world of fashion is very brilliant in the season and very dismal out of it, a fairyland to visit but a desert to live in. It's interesting that the thing we get to see most inside of her head is that she is very, very bored, and we don't get to see much more of that, but we do get a certain sense of her internal thoughts from the way she reacts to two particular events. One, as I already mentioned, is what happens after Tolkienhorn reads the law document. We don't know if it's something in the law document or to do with the writing that she asks about before, but we're led to ask why she asks about that and why it provokes such an intense reaction in her for her to faint, which unless the deadlock says she never does. Another passage I think it's worth noting is early on in the chapter when she's watching from her window and she sees a little child running outside to greet assumedly their father coming home and their mother chasing after them and this puts her out of temper and I think it's interesting that one of the first things we see about Lady Deadlock, one of the first reactions we see her have is a reaction of anger and irritation and distress to seeing 
happiness and to seeing love between family members. Another person I want to quickly mention is Sir Lester Dedlock. I love Sir Lester Dedlock quite a lot and I think he's a very interesting character and very sort of believable because Dickens combines in him this sense of immense family pride. He is an incredibly proud man but also this great tenderness and love that he has for his wife which shows us a nicer side of him aside from his great pride. Although he is incredibly proud, he was not too proud to marry a woman who didn't have much family because he loved her. And now I want to talk about Mr Tolkienhorn because as I said he is a very very interesting character. One of the first things we are told about him is about the clothes he wears. To begin with they are old-fashioned, he wears knee breeches which is quite old-fashioned for this time in the Victorian period. Mute clothes irresponsive to any glancing light, his dress is like himself. We're told at once that he is detached and unresponsive. I love the line where Dickens says, while Mr Tolkienhorn may not know what is passing in the deadlock mind at present, it is very possible that he may. And this sentence I think is quite telling because it tells us from the beginning that Mr Tolkienhorn is a bit of an enigma. Not even our omniscient narrator is willing to speculate on whether or not Mr Tolkienhorn knows what the deadlocks are thinking. So I think that's all I have to say about this chapter and now I will go on to talk about chapter three, a progress. So chapter three, a progress, a chapter in which much more happens than in the previous two chapters but it is the long chapter in this part as well. In this chapter we are introduced to Esther Sumson who is our narrator for maybe about half of the book. We are told about Esther's childhood in which she grew up with a woman she knew as her godmother but who was actually apparently her aunt in fact though not in law and we are told about how Esther is always felt to be separate from other children how she is looked down upon and we're given to understand that this is because Esther has been born out of wedlock Esther feels very put upon through all of her childhood and feels very very much that she is worthless that she has no place in society that she deserves no society or no love and affection but after the death of her aunt she ends up getting sent away to school but while on the way to school traveling in a carriage she meets a mysterious man who throws some plump cake out the window after she refuses to eat it a glorious glorious moment of wonder and then she goes to school where she is surprised to find that everyone really likes her after several years at school she is then one day taken out of school by her guardian Mr Jarndyce who suggests she come as a companion to one Ada Clare who is about to come with her cousin Richard Carston to live with Mr Jarndyce because they are wards in Jarndyce the wards who are mentioned in the first chapter so Esther heads on to London where she is met first by one Mr Guppy another by favourite characters in Bleak House very entertaining young gentleman and then goes on to meet Mr Kenge who is a lawyer also the Lord Chancellor and also Richard and Ada who she is soon to live with and then they are taken at the end of the chapter to go and stay with a family called the Jellybees before they go on to Mr John Dice's house Bleak House the next day. So points of interest in this chapter firstly I want to talk a little bit about the general dual narrative structure of Bleak House I would say that personally I probably prefer the third person chapters to Esther's chapters. Not that there aren't like many of my favourite scenes that happen in Esther's chapters but Esther's narrative voice can sometimes be a little bit grating, I don't know. Esther is incredibly self-deprecating and while I think we definitely get a sense of why it's also interesting that as far as I can see Dickens lords Esther's self-deprecation as something that is incredibly sort of moral like she is presented as being good partly because she doesn't think herself good and that in itself is a kind of virtue. I find it's interesting to compare Esther Summerson with Jane Eyre but if we look at the way they are treated in their childhood for example I think there are some similarities in the way Jane is treated by her aunt and Esther is treated by her aunt. But Jane and Esther are very very different characters. Jane Eyre asserts in Jane Eyre her right to happiness and her right to love where as in Esther we find someone who really believes that she has no right to happiness and no right to love which I find quite sad but also really really interesting and especially I think because the fact that she feels that is, is kind of presented by Dickens as a sort of virtue. Esther is definitely one of Dickens's angel figures but I think she's very different from some of their angel figures we get in his early books who are pretty much beautiful, good and nothing much else. Esther is much more complicated than that. For one, unlike most of Dickens's heroines we do not know in this chapter at least whether or not she is beautiful although Mr Guppy kind of thinks she's pretty I suppose which might give a sense that she might be. Her parents also weren't married and that in itself is quite a radical thing for Dickens to present a woman whose parents weren't married as being this angel figure and it is a real critique of the way that Victorian society punishes the children of parents who weren't married and I do think that Dickens with the character of Esther and with the way her aunt treats her strongly strongly criticises that behaviour and strongly strongly criticises the stigma against children of unmarried parents within Victorian society. Esther fits into some of Dickens's earlier female angels in that she is keen to look after others, she immediately inspires love of others, she is maternal and friendly and kind. She is good 
to her core. She is self-deprecating, she doesn't think highly of herself but she thinks highly of others, and she is good at housework. She also strives to be useful. But actually, her striving to be useful doesn't necessarily fit in with Dickens's earlier angel figures, because what is interesting about Esther and what sets her apart and makes her a more complicated figure is that she is not just hardworking and industrious, but she is good at things. The first thing she says to us is, I have a great deal of difficulty in beginning to write my portion of these pages, for I know I am not clever. But that's wrong. That is a lie. That is a self-deprecating lie. Esther is clever, and I think we see throughout the book that she is clever. She also views herself as being dislikable and thoroughly unlovable, whereas we see at school, and also from the immediate reaction that Ada and Richard have to her, and Mr Guppy as well, that she is really likeable, and everyone really likes her because she is nice and engaging, and people immediately are drawn to her kindness. And we also see that she is clever, she does well at school, she very quickly ends up helping teach the other students. And later on in the book we also see other incidences of her intelligence. And it's quite important, I think, for Dickens that his presentation of Esther as in some way a model of perfection also incorporates intelligence, both emotional and of other sorts. I also just want to quickly talk about Esther Summerson's name. It's important that her name is Esther because that relates to a biblical figure. And then her surname, Summerson. It's spelt Sun, S-O-N, but it of course is a homophone for S-U-N, Summer Sun something bright which lights things. If you think as well of the first chapter in Chancery in which we get the sense of London being so misty and dark having gone into mourning for the death of the sun and then we get Esther, this summer sun, this brightness, this bright angelic figure who draws people towards her who is a warming force. But I think it's also interesting that it's not spelt S-U-N, it's spelt S-O-N, reflecting back on surnames like Johnson and Williamson and Thompson, which would generally refer to the name of your father. But obviously she doesn't know who her father is, and she doesn't know who her mother is, and she knows nothing about them. It's a name that's been created for her, and it's quite like ironic that her name means the son of summer, although she has no parents. Anyway, I do have lots of other stuff to talk about in this tablet. Sorry, it's gonna be a long video. Anyway, I want to talk a bit more about the way in which Dickens criticises Esther's godmother's treatment of her and the treatment of children born out of marriage. We're told that Esther's aunt was a good, good woman because she went to church three times each Sunday, but we're also told that she was grave and strict. She was so very good herself, I thought, that the badness of other people made her frown all her life. She was handsome, and if she had ever smiled would have been, I used to think, like an angel, but she never smiled. This is a woman who is entirely cold, and she may be good in one sense, that she goes to church very often and she believes in sort of strong morals, but actually she has a terrible effect on Esther. I think you can view Esther and especially her self-deprecating nature as being this hangover, this kind of leftover trauma from the way that she was treated as a child and the way that she was taught to hate herself as a child. We are told by Esther that Esther's aunt was a good woman, but we see very clearly as readers that Esther's aunt was a horrible person who has treated this child very badly. She says to Esther, it would have been far better, little Esther, that you had had no birthday, that you had never been born. Your mother, Esther, is your disgrace and you were hers. Yourself, unfortunate girl, orphaned and degraded from the first of these evil anniversaries, pray deadly that the sins of others be not visited upon your head according to what is written. Forget your mother and leave all other people to forget her who will do her unhappy child that greatest kindness. Submission, self-denial, diligent work are the preparations for a life begun in such a shadow on it. We are shown by Dickens how damaging this is and also by Esther's deep goodness and kindness how wrong Esther's aunt was. But Esther has clearly taken her aunt's words to heart. We get such a sense of how much she is very self-deprecating and thinks so little of herself, and also that submission, self-denial, and diligent work are the ways in which Esther lives her life, which we will see again and again throughout the book. And Dickens kind of lords it, which I find slightly troubling and does annoy me throughout this book, but I think it's certainly very interesting to note how submission, self-denial, diligent work, these three things sum up Esther in so, so many ways, as we'll talk about again and again in this book. And we get a sense of her longing to be useful, her longing to do good to other people more than to be happy herself, and this idea that she does not deserve happiness. Another passage I want to quickly mention is the passage just before her aunt's death, where her aunt has this weird attack and cries loudly, he that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. This refers to a Bible story in which a woman caught in adultery was sentenced to death by stoning, and Jesus said to the men that were going to stone her, he that is without sin, sin amongst you, let him cast the first stone at her. Basically saying like, 
you are all sinners and therefore you can't take moral high ground against someone who is a sinner like you. Very significant that Esther's godmother says this and dies because Esther's godmother has been casting metaphorical stones at Esther all her life and that she dies saying this suggests that perhaps she has realised the wrong that she has done. And it's also Dickens saying that for Victorian society to ostracise children born to unmarried parents is incredibly immoral and hypocritical considering that Victorian society is by no means perfectly moral itself. Before I go on to talking about Esther's meeting with Ada and Richard, I also quickly want to talk about the strange man in the coach. It's one of my favourite passages of the whole book, I think. First she says, confound Mrs Rachel, let her fly away on a high wind with a broomstick, kind of creating this idea of this eccentricity of this mysterious man, and also um, the kind of fairy tale and supernatural elements and language that crop up throughout this book. There's a lot of references to ghosts and also a lot of fairy tale references, especially in Esther's narrative, which I find quite interesting. And also I just, I love the moment where he offers her a plum cake and she says no thank you very much because they are too rich for me. Another moment of self-denial and submission and believing herself not good enough for things. She doesn't even think herself like good enough to have a plum cake because she thinks it would be too rich for her. And then, flawed again said the gentleman which I didn't at all understand and threw them both out the window. He throws the cake out the window. I love Dickens. So absurd! So absurd. Again we see Esther's self-denial and submission at her time at school. The other girls are really really fond of her and she says she feels almost ashamed to have done so little and have won so much. She is almost ashamed to think of how much people love her because she doesn't believe that she deserves their love. Really sad. Before I talk about Ada and Richard, I want to very quickly mention Miss Flight, who we encounter again. Richard, on seeing her, immediately says to the others, mad, not thinking that they can hear them. But actually, Miss Flight, however eccentric she may be, is not mad. She is rational and she entirely understands him. We also find out that she is in some way associated with perhaps Jarndyce. I don't think it's clear at this stage and that she was a ward herself. She says to them that it is a good omen for youth and hope and beauty when they find themselves in this place and then immediately goes on to say that she had youth and hope and beauty once and now she is a little old lady that everyone thinks is mad and she is not a good omen for the wards in Jandice. She is the entirely the opposite of a good omen for the wards in Jandice because she shows them in some senses what their future could be. I also want to quickly talk about the relationships between Esther, Ada and Richard. I really enjoy these three as a trio and I really like their friendships throughout the book and I'll talk a lot throughout the book about Esther's relationship with Richard because it's just you so rarely get a platonic male-female friendship in Victorian literature and it's really enjoyable. And I also really like the relationship between Esther and Ada, although it is slightly odd. I have to say that Dickens' descriptions of female friendships I do find slightly weird. And I don't know if it's just that like I'm an unaffectionate person or that in the Victorian period all women were more affectionate with their friends or if it's just that Dickens imagines all women are just like really touchy-feely with their female friends and also constantly refer to each other by pet names. I don't know, but I always find the female friendships in Dickens a bit odd. They often feel quite sort of romantic in a way, which is quite interesting. Esther refers to Ada as my pet, my darling, my love, etc. But it is interesting how these three are so soon drawn together and so soon attach themselves to each other and become good friends. And it's partly because they're all in a slightly odd position. None of them have met Mr. Jarmice before, none of them know where they're going, all of them are a bit confused, and all of them are about the same age. They're late teenagers. Esther might be a little bit older. I have in my head that Esther is 21, but I'm not sure where I actually got that from. And then Ada and Richard are sort of 17 and 19. So they are all pretty young people and they're thrown together in this way and it makes them bond together. I also think it's important to mention as an instance of the way that Esther comes across to other people and how she comes across as intelligent and important because Richard Carson immediately after they leave says where do we go next Miss Summerson assumes that she is a figure of authority in some way and that she will know more than them. I think that's all I have to say about this chapter quite a lot I know but it's an interesting chapter and there is a lot to say about it and next I will go on to talk about the fourth chapter telescopic philanthropy. In this chapter Esther, Ada and Richard are taken to the house of Mrs Jellyby, who is a friend in some way of Mr Jarndyce, who will soon be their guardian. When they get there they find the house in great disarray. Mrs Jellyby is a lady of charity who entirely devotes herself and her life to charity work, um, chiefly sort of setting up innovations in Africa, but entirely neglects her home life. Her children are all dirty, unwashed and unhappy and uncared for and neglected, and her husband never speaks because he feels so put upon. Esther Summerson is somewhat shocked by the state of this place but her and Ada retire to bed and while Ada is asleep in comes Caddy, Mrs Jellyby's eldest daughter, who 
is very interesting. I love Caddy. A bit like Esther, she is self-deprecating and dislikes herself, but she's very, very angry about the fact that she dislikes herself and that she has to be self-deprecating because she thinks it is her mother's fault and also because she feels that Esther and Ada must judge her for it and she is angry about that, but also fond of Esther immediately because like so many people she is immediately drawn to Esther's goodness. So that's basically what happens in this chapter and let's talk about the points of interest in this chapter. Chiefly we're going to start off by talking about Mrs Jellyby and her charitable works because Mrs Jellyby is really interesting. I'll talk about this a lot as the book goes on but I find the presentation of Mrs Jellyby quite hard to deal with. And there are a few things that I think are worth thinking about here. One thing I find hard is that Dickens is incredibly critical of the gender roles in the family. Um, the fact that Mr Jellyby never talks and is submissive. It is presented as both comic and sad and wrong. The, the best way Mr Kenge can describe Mr Jellyby is by saying that he is the husband of Mrs Jellyby. Mrs Jellyby is presented as being sort of domineering within their household and Mr Jellyby never talks so much that Esther Summerson doesn't even realise that he is the master of the house because in a way there is no master of ha this house, there is just a mistress. And Dickens is quite critical of this, which I find slightly annoying. Dickens is also incredibly critical of Mrs Jellyby as a character and the fact that she dedicates her time to this charitable work in Africa rather than looking after her children and herself. Indeed, Dickens goes so far as to say, Mrs Jellyby had very good hair but was too much occupied with her African duties to brush it. I remember quoting this line in my dissertation because Dickens kind of implies that, along with other things, Mrs Jellyby is a bad woman and not a very womanly woman because she neglects her beauty in favour of charitable works. And I find this intensely problematic and you can criticise Dickens very highly for it. Her household situation is somewhat more complicated. On the one hand Dickens is incredibly critical of the fact that Mrs Jellyby is engaged in this charitable work because for him it is not the correct sphere for this woman to be in because she ought to be a better housewife. And I think that is intensely problematic and you see Mrs Jellyby's intelligence, her desire for activity and her desire to do good but also to do work and Dickens solely, strongly criticises her for not just being a housewife. On the other hand she is shown as being neglectful and in some instances quite cruel and cold towards her children. She doesn't care that her son got his head stuck in railings, she doesn't care that he's crying and she is oblivious to her daughter Caddy's unhappiness which is obviously doesn't necessarily make her a lovely person either. Mrs Jellyby is a character I struggle with in Bleak House because I do find Dickens' presentation of her problematic and it does trouble me. I do think there's another thing that's worth talking about here because I don't think that Dickens really criticises Mrs Jellyby on any sort of colonial grounds but I think it is possible as a modern reader to criticise Mrs Jellyby and her charitable works. Looking at it from a post-colonial perspective Dickens criticises Mrs Jellyby as a character for doing charitable activity for Africa rather than looking after her children because of that expression, you know, charity begins at home, the idea that she is neglecting what is before her and what is her immediate duty in order to take on other responsibilities. He criticises her for the charitable work she does in Africa because he suggests that she has no right to do it when she has more pressing duties at home. But I think it's also very possible to criticise her for doing charitable work in Africa when she possibly has no right to interfere there. I'm not sure if Dickens does criticise her for that. It's something I hadn't really thought about until this reading. But I do think you can maybe see Dickens as critiquing Mrs Jellyby not just from a gender perspective but also from a perspective to do with empire and whether or not she has a right to interfere in Africa. Mr Ken says that Mrs Jellyby is at present devoted to the subject of Africa with a view to the general conservation of the coffee berry and the natives and the happy settlement on the banks of Africa. African rivers. And later Esther talking about the letters she receives says that they were applications from people excited in various ways about the cultivation of the coffee and natives. The way that Dickens speaks twice about the cultivation of coffee and natives suggests in part that maybe Mrs Jellyby's efforts are not just towards trying to help people in Africa but also trying to get something from the economy there. People excited in various ways about the cultivation of coffee and natives. Are people excited about the cultivation of coffee and also excited about natives? Or are they excited about the cultivation of coffee and the cultivation of natives? Cultivate can refer to both cultivating land for growing plants and also to cultivating mines and developing mines. So there is the suggestion of education of African people, but, but also that word cultivation especially because it also refers to cultivating land for farming, kind of suggests this idea of getting something from the people and in some way taking advantage of the people in Africa. I'll talk a bit more about Mrs Jellyby and her work and Dickens's criticism of other women 
engaged in charitable works to the neglect of their family a bit later on in the book because this is a theme throughout the book and one that I find complicated um, but certainly interesting to talk about. I talked a lot about the character of Esther in the last chapter so I won't go on much here about the way in which she is immediately maternal, the way that she takes much better care for one evening of Mrs Jellyby's children than Mrs Jellyby ever does and the fact that she immediately draws Caddy to her in this kind of affectionate way but instead as I've already talked a lot about Esther in this video I'll talk a bit about Caddy. I think she's very interesting as a kind of foil to Esther because like Esther she is very self-deprecating and she thinks very lowly of herself but unlike Esther she doesn't blame herself for her life and the way she is. She blames her mother and she blames the household and she believes that she has a right to be better and to be happier than she is which Esther doesn't really believe and whereas Esther only thinks that her aunt and Mrs Rachel are good to to think badly of her, Caddy is furious that in her mind Esther and Ada might judge her for something she views as intensely not her fault. I can't do anything except write, I'm always writing for Ma, I wonder you two are not ashamed of yourselves to come in this afternoon and see me able to do nothing else, it was like your ill nature, yet you think yourselves very fine, I dare say. It's disgraceful, you know it is, the whole house is disgraceful, the children are disgraceful, I'm disgraceful, path miserable and no wonder, I wish I were dead, I wish we were all dead, it would be a great deal better for us. Caddy is intensely miserable but she's also angry that she's miserable and angry because she believes she has a right to not be miserable in a way that Esther I think doesn't think she has that right to happiness so I think they're a very interesting pair to compare and also whereas Esther is sort of quiet and submissive Addie is distinctly not submissive she is described as sulky and she resents the things that she is forced to submit to so I think Caddie is a really interesting character and I'll talk a bit more about her as the book goes on but I think that is all I wanted to say about the first four chapters of Bleak House. This is going to be a very long video, I'm sorry, but I had a lot to say. I love Bleak House a lot, but it also at times irritates me, but it also at sometimes amazes me with how amazing and brilliant the writing is and how interesting the themes are. And I think it is a wonderful, fascinating book, and I'm so excited to be doing this read-along. I'm quite, like, pumped right now for Bleak House. In the month of April, we will be reading Chapter 5, A Morning Adventure, Chapter 6, Quiet at Home, and Chapter 7, The Ghost's Walk. I am very excited. Please let me know down in the comments if you're taking part in the read along and what you thought of these month's chapters. I really hope that you will all enjoy Bleak House very much. Thank you very much for watching and I'll be back very soon with another bookish video.